All right, guys, I'm back. I want Dr. Gary. So this video is on low level laser light therapy for the treatment of hair loss. We're gonna cover the history, the mechanism of action, the different devices that are out there, treatment frequency and duration, as well as is it as good as finasteride or minoxidil, some of the risks of low level laser light therapy, what we know and what we don't know, and a summary. And at the end, I'll tell you about my recommended device for low level laser light, which people ask me uh, quite often. So this is part of our series on non-surgical hair restoration modalities. Be sure to check out our other videos on minoxidil, finasteride, microneedling. A reminder to everyone that when it comes to medical therapies for hair restoration, I usually recommend being on at least two different modalities of treatment for hair maintenance and for regrowth as it pertains to androgenic alopecia. And with medical therapies, in order to continue to see improvement and results from the treatment, you have to keep doing it. It's not a one and done type of scenario. Getting into the history of low-level laser light, in the late 1960s, Andre Mester, a Hungarian physician, began a series of experiments on the basically carcinogenic potential of lasers, right? Can they cause cancer by using a low power ruby laser? And it was a 694 nanometer wavelength laser, and he was doing this on mice. And to his surprise, laser did not cause cancer, but it actually helped improve hair growth around the shaved area on the animal's back. And so that was the first clue. And this was the first demonstration of photobiostimulation with low level laser light therapy. And over the years, it's been shown to stimulate cellular activity with improved healing, nerve regeneration, joint pain relief, stroke recovery, and prevention and treatment of mucositis. That's just a couple of examples. Early research stemmed from trying to grow hair faster for cancer patients, actually, who were undergoing chemotherapy. That's what spurred a lot of the early research. And it was first FDA cleared for androgenic alopecia in 2007. In terms of the mechanism of action, you have to think about like the whole electromagnetic spectrum. And remember, there's just a portion of that spectrum that has visible light. And this um, low-level laser light is in the red or near-infrared light range, 600 to 950 nanometers, and that's what's utilized in low-level laser light therapy at a low power. That's that's the key. It's not just about the wavelength, it's the fact that it's low power that's being used. And the targeted chromophore, what's actually absorbing the light is cytochrome C oxidase. That's what's thought to be the chromophore. And in terms of how it's helping hair, there's a stimulation of the stem cells in the hair follicle bulge, and that's shifting the follicles more towards an antigen or growth phase. And there's a biphasic effect of this type of uh, low-level laser light. Low irradiation doses actually may cause biostimulation, and that's what we're talking about with hair restoration. But at higher radiation doses, you actually can get an inhibition. So as we get into talking about some of the, like the powers that are used, the, the different power settings, keep that in mind that it's about having the power high enough to create a nice change, but if it's too high, you're actually going to inhibit hair growth. Most of the devices on the market use a wavelength of 655 nanometers. That was what was originally tested in clinical trials and pretty much that's persisted and, and that's what most sort of uh, me too uh, devices uh, use. Though there are some more recent studies that suggest that there's maybe better efficacy at the slightly higher range, so 700 to 800 nanometer range. LEDs are being incorporated into these low level laser light devices and and they might deliver the same recommended energy level, which is about four joules per centimeter squared, though it is a different light source. So something that's important to keep in mind, we have this table here that it shows you the differences between laser and LEDs. Laser is a more coherent sort of narrow band of light and it comes at a higher cost. LEDs are cheaper and they're more incoherent and divergent spectrums of light, but potentially can still produce the same energy levels and uh, have been shown to still be helpful. And more and more devices are incorporating the LEDs to drop the price down. We're gonna post the picture of just showing you some examples of different types of uh, systems that are on the market. 
And then I found this really handy table uh, from one of the papers and it goes through like the when it was FDA cleared, the name of the device, the actual light source, is it LED, is it laser diodes, the design, remember there are combs, there are uh, hands-free sports caps that are used, headbands, there's different styles, right? It's still the same type of energy, but it's like a different way of wearing it. And certain ones might benefit some people more than others and it depends on your lifestyle and all those things. Also here in this table you can see recommended treatment frequency and duration. So for example with Capillus it's six minutes daily. With some of the other treatments like I Restore 25 minutes every other day. The most um, common type of frequency that at least that was tested in, in the literature was about 20 to 30 minutes three times a week. And then you can see the approximate costs. Some of the more expensive models are like the laser cap and the uh, hair max is expensive and, and certain capillus types of caps are the pricier ones. Make sure that you guys are subscribed to the channel. Um, if you aren't already, just hit that button, turn on notifications, we really do appreciate that. And this way you're notified when we put up new videos, which is now pretty often. Duration of treatment and the frequency, as you just saw, it varies among the different devices. And the most frequent, I just mentioned to you guys, about uh, 50, I'd say the broader range is 15 to 30 minutes, either every other day or three times a week. That's how most of them do it. But the treatment time and the length is really dependent on the device itself and also the recommendation from the manufacturer. A lot of the specific uh, durations are not necessarily backed by clinical trials, but it's kind of what the manufacturer believes makes the most sense based on the energy that's coming out of the device. And the actual optimal energy and treatment time for hair growth enhancement is kind of unknown still. We don't know exactly what's the truly best setting to use and that's something that's still being explored. A couple of important notes when it comes to low-level laser light uh, devices. They are cleared for individuals with a Fitzpatrick skin types of one through four. We'll flash what that means and the different uh, skin types that exist because darker skin actually decreases the transmission of light and can reduce the efficacy. So that's something that's important to keep in mind and all the clinical trials have really focused on Fitzpatrick uh, skin types of one through, through four. And the device needs to be very close to the scalp to work well and that's because of the penetration of light. So as you move away from the area that you're trying to stimulate, the efficacy goes down dramatically. So that's why a comb, for example, like a laser comb, might be better than a cap for someone with like very long hair. But is it as good as finasteride or minoxidil? There was a study I saw that looked at the changes in hair density, which is defined as hairs per centimeter squared in some of the larger studies that were done on these different modalities. So when you look at oral finasteride, th that general range, and of course there are studies that show less than this effect and more, but the hairs per centimeter squared for oral finasteride in, in terms of the hair density improvement is about 13 to 27. Topical minoxidil, 12 to 20. Low level light therapy, 17 to 20 in some of the bigger studies that were done on that modality. So low level laser light therapy is a real option for hair restoration because some patients you know think that it's completely a hoax and and it's just um, doesn't work none of it works that's not true i mean there's good data to support its efficacy if it's done in the right energy uh, level in terms of the risks it's overall very safe however like anything that has any degree of efficacy there's always going to be some risks as well most common thing would be shedding just like with minoxidil when you're first starting it out or with really uh, most types of, of hair restoration medical modalities. There's this temporary kind of telogen effluvium in the first one to two months and it tends to disappear as you continue to apply that treatment. There's also a risk of stimulating some dysplastic or malignant lesions on the scalp so you can cause that to grow more if you apply low level light therapy in theory. Other side effects that have been reported are acne, burning sensations, dry skin, headaches, itchiness. So those are some of the other risks. So what do we know about low-level light therapy? There are a lot of things we don't know, but what we do know so far from some of the data that's been done is that at higher energies, meaning like a higher dose of irradiation, that is going to increase the hair density more than using the lower energy up to a certain point. We don't yet know exactly where that point is, but when you look at higher energies of treatment, usually that's better. And it's important to keep in mind that a lot of the studies don't report on the total dose that was used. So you'll have a you'll have a device with say like 100 diodes, right? 100 
100 laser diodes or 100 LEDs and you know that roughly they emit say five joules each but you won't necessarily know what was the total impact it's not an easy calculation of just like 100 times five and say okay this is the total energy output and a lot of um, the, the, the companies and the studies they don't release that information and they don't even calculate it so that is something that we need to more information on and the overall energy is not necessarily correlated with the number of diodes um, per se so that's something important to keep in mind it's not just about buying the machine with with the most number of diodes especially as you start to compare across different companies it's more effective when the energy released is pulsed as opposed to continuous energy so when it's pulsed we know that that helps with the biostimulation and increasing the duration per session of treatment also seems to help so now let's cover things that we still don't know we don't know the best wavelength the best power to use the best treatment time the best treatment frequency or which light source is optimal is it led is it laser diode we still don't exactly know all those parameters we don't know if there's a tolerance that builds up to, to low level laser light therapy where you basically stop improving as far as your hair growth goes and we also don't know if someone has longer thicker hair by how much is that reducing the light penetration and the overall efficacy of this low level light therapy modality. So in summary, photomodulation or photobiomodulation, which is what is often referred to as low level laser light therapy, it's this overall safe and potentially effective modality for the management of hair loss. The treatment time and frequency will be dependent on the device you choose. And as far as which device I recommend in my practice these days, at least in 2021, we like to recommend the Capillus laser therapy cap and we don't get any money from them. This is not a sponsored video. We like it for its design, the kind of sports cap style, the treatment time, six to seven minutes per session daily, kind of fits into a lot of people's lives and the available data seems strong, but there's still no clear winner when it comes to looking at all the different devices on the market. So it could be quite confusing from a consumer's perspective. If you enjoy this video, please make sure to check out my video on finasteride. It's another medical modality and one that I think you'll find interesting. Click on the card and I'll see you there. Thanks very much.